So, you have a movie for me? Yes, sir, I do. It's a fun little animated movie for kids. Oh, that sounds like fun. What's it about? It's about this girl, Coraline, who finds a magical secret passage to an alternate world that has alternate versions of her parents. Oh, that's actually perfect. I've been promising my daughter that I'd produce a kid's movie, and let me just call her real quick, okay? She's gonna love this. Sure. Hey, Cindy, Daddy's finally gonna make a children's movie, just like he promised, okay? Oh, uh, such a sweet moment. She's super happy. This is really gonna help our family situation. Anyway, Coraline's other parents have buttons sewn into their skulls where their eyes should be. Daddy's gonna call you back, okay, Cindy? Bye, Cindy. What was that about the buttons? Oh, they all have buttons sewn into their eyeballs, and Coraline's other mother has a history of stealing children's eyeballs and sewing buttons in their places. Oh my god. With needles so sharp, you can barely feel them. Oh, I thought I heard you say it was a kid's movie. Yeah, 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 kids are gonna love it. There's a talking cat and stuff. Oh, talking cats are tight. They sure are, sir. That button thing sounds like a super horrifying element, though, but start from the beginning. Maybe I'm not getting it. Sure, well, Coraline and her parents move into a new place, but her parents are too too busy to spend time with her. Sounds like a good kids movie so far. And she meets this local kid named YB. Oh, that's a cute name. It's short for Y Born. Wow, okay, that's like one step up from naming your kid Mistake. Yeah, and he says that his grandmother owns the Pink Palace Apartments and doesn't usually let kids move in, but he's not supposed to talk about it. Oh, and later if you put two and two together, you're like, oh, it's because she knows that kids keep disappearing from there. Yeesh, so why does she allow Coraline and her family to move in? So the movie can happen. Gotcha. So anyway, YB gives Coraline a doll he found that looks exactly exactly like her, except it has buttons for eyes. Instant red flag, so she throws it away. No, she carries it around, and eventually it starts changing places on its own. Another massive red flag, so she throws it away. She does not, and eventually she finds a passageway to the other world that's like a more colorful version of her home, where the parents have buttons sewn into their skulls. Please tell me that's a red flag for her. Oh yeah, that does freak her out. Okay, good. For about five seconds, then she immediately and completely gets over it and has dinner with them. Oh, she does. Yeah, and she's gonna go back to the real world, and that's just gonna confirm how amazing everything is in the other world. How so? Well, like, she wants her mom to buy her a pair of $25 gloves, but she doesn't want to. Totally reasonable decision, actually. So Coraline's gonna go back into the other world and just have a great time. Oh yeah? What kind of stuff does she do? Well, these two silly old ladies are gonna put on a big show and the audience is gonna be filled with dogs. Oh, okay. You know what? Other than the button thing and the doll thing, this actually sounds like a pretty good movie for kids. And the two old ladies are gonna be practically naked. One of them's barely covering up her nipples. Oh, there it is. And eventually, Coraline's gonna start to catch on that stuff in the other world is kind of weird. Finally, so how does she start to catch on? Well, first of all, her other mother tells her she can stay forever if she gets her eyeballs replaced with buttons. Wow, at this point, I'm surprised she caught on that that's a red flag. Yeah, and also her other father and other YB start to warn her that other mother created this whole place just to lure her in. So how are other father and other YB able to warn her? What do you mean? Well, if the other mother created the whole world, that means she also created other father and other YB. Right. So why would she create them with free will and an under understanding of good and evil. I don't know. Fair enough. So eventually Coraline's gonna get thrown inside a mirror where she's gonna meet the eyeless ghosts of children that have been there so long they've forgotten their lives. Oh, why are you like this? It's just fun times. What kind of awful stuff happened to you as a kid? You couldn't possibly imagine. So anyway, the dead kids are like, if you find our eyes, you'll free our souls. So she sets out to find the eyes. Yes, yeah, she has to find all three of them. I thought you said there were three kids, so she'd have to find six eyeballs. Listen, who's to say how many eyes humans have? By all yeah, nobody knows. So I imagine it's gonna be hard for Coraline to wander around in a world that other mother completely created and look for the dead kid eyes. Actually, it's gonna be super easy, barely an inconvenience. Oh, really? Yeah, we're gonna say that the other mother has a thing for games, so Coraline's gonna be like, I have a game. Let me try to find the eyeballs. And that works. It does, and so then she does. Wow, well, I'm glad the horrifying moments are over and we can wrap up And the... then other mother's gonna turn into a giant spider with needles for limbs. And her eyes are gonna get gouged out and she's gonna blindly chase Coraline through a giant disgusting web and try to rip her eyes out. Did you hear what I said? I did. I did. So, so what do you think of the movie? Well, it sounds absolutely horrifying, but I already promised my daughter we'd make it, so I guess my hands are tied. Fantastic. And I think if I hire a band like They Might Be Giants to put together kind of a fun soundtrack, we could maybe make this enjoyable for kids. Oh, that's a really good way to lighten things up. I'm gonna make sure that doesn't work out. What? So you have a pitch for a kid's movie? Yes, sir, I do. It's called The Boss Baby. But. Babies aren't bosses. Nope, they're not, but in this movie, there's a baby that is a boss. But... You are blowing my mind right now. You need a minute? Yeah, maybe just a minute. 
Okay, so the baby is a boss. Yeah, he's got a little suit and a little briefcase and a really deep voice. Why does he have a deep voice? Because he's the boss. Yeah, but men get deeper voices during puberty when their larynx grows thicker and larger. Yeah, he's the boss though, so he needs a deep voice. So you're saying that physically he's a baby in every way, but he's got like, a man throat? Yeah, I guess so. Okay, just checking. So anyway, the boss baby's in middle management at Baby Corps, and he infiltrates this family. Wait, 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 Baby Corps? Yeah, when babies are made, they're either sent into families, or they work at the Baby Corporation. What kind of company is it? It's like a business company. But what do they sell? Like, what's their product or service? I guess the product is the babies themselves. So they sell children. Well, yeah, but it's much cuter than that. Like, the babies are very concerned that puppies are getting more love than they are. They've got, like, love charts and stuff. Oh, so, like, instead of dealing in money, they deal in love. Well, not exactly, because the boss baby's gonna have, like, a lot of money. He he's very rich. So they are making money off of these babies. Somehow, yes. So they sell children. Well, we're not gonna call it that because I feel like that might have some human rights implications, but they make money off the distribution of babies. Right, but in a cute way. Sure. Also because it's baby selling babies, it's probably okay. Maybe. So anyway, what's the story about? Well, Boss Baby goes into this family where there's a seven-year-old named Tim, and Tim is not happy about that. How come? He's mad that the Boss Baby is stealing his parents' affection. And he's also freaked out about the fact that he has a briefcase and wears a suit all the time. The parents don't seem concerned about all that. They do not. Huh. So anyway, Tim finds out that the Boss Baby can talk, so he's like, what? And then we're gonna have a bunch of business jokes. Nice. Yeah, you know how kids these days respond really well to business jokes? Do you have an example of a funny scene? Well, for example, we'll have Tim spy on the boss baby as he's trying to run a meeting with other babies. Oh, boss baby meets with other babies? Yeah, but it doesn't go well for him. How come? Well, he's meeting with a bunch of babies, so they're all super incompetent. But he's a baby. Yeah, but these babies won't have any of his skills for some reason. Oh. Anyway, we find out that the puppies getting too much love thing is a serious problem for the baby business. Oh no. Yeah, and apparently a company called Puppy Co. that Tim's parents work for are launching a new type of dog in Las Vegas. They're launching a new type of dog? Exactly. What does that even mean? Like they made a new dog and they're having a product launch. That doesn't make any sense. Oh, I know. Why do you sound so proud about that? Because at the end of the film, we're gonna reveal that this whole movie was just Tim telling his daughter his super imaginative recollection of how his baby brother came into the family. Oh, so nothing in the movie actually has to make sense. Exactly, so I basically gave myself a free pass to write literally anything I wanted. Amazing. Yeah, so the script is gonna contradict itself, it's gonna have world building that falls apart if you think about it even a little bit. Wow. And it's gonna be very unclear what's real and what's not. And it's all okay. It's all okay because it's not real and nothing matters. That's very smart, right? Either that or very lazy. No, it's very smart. Okay. Anyway, so Boss Baby and Tim start working together. Because if they find some info on the new puppy, Boss Baby can finish his job and leave the family. So what do they do? Well, they go to this Bring Your Kids to Work Day at Puppy Co. But then they discover that the CEO wants to use this formula that keeps Boss Baby a baby to create a forever puppy to boost sales and put the babies out of business. None of that makes much sense at all. Nope, doesn't have to. What would happen if the babies got put out of business? Like there'd be no more babies? I guess. Humans would just love puppies so much that they wouldn't want to have babies anymore. Essentially, yeah. The human race would come to an end because now there are puppies that don't age. That's what we're going with. All right. Anyway, so the bad guy kidnaps Tim's parents and brings them to Vegas. So you know, Tim and Boss Baby have to find a way there too. Is that gonna be hard for them to do? No, it's gonna be super easy, barely an inconvenience. How so? Well, they pretend to be an Elvis impersonator, so the Elvis impersonator working at the airport just lets them in. Why is there an Elvis working at the- Doesn't have to make sense. Right, I keep trying to make sense of the stuff you're saying. You gotta stop doing that. Yeah, I'll try. Anyway, so they manage to stop the bad guy before he can launch all the forever puppies. And so he falls into a vat of formula and turns into a baby himself. That is horrifying. It's pretty terrifying, yeah. What happens to all the forever puppies? What do you mean? Well, they're still alive, right? Are they gonna be adopted? No, because if they did, the babies would get less love, remember? Right, so does that mean that the puppies are gonna die? Well, I mean, we're not gonna go that far, but I guess they'd either have to die or be homeless for the babies to stay in business. Wow. Yeah. But anyway, nothing matters. Exactly, nothing makes sense and nothing matters. So it's all good, all good. So what do you think? Well, I think people will enjoy it despite its flaws, so what the hell, let's make it. Great, I mean, we shouldn't expect any Oscar nominations on a project like this, but it'll be a fun little movie.
So, you have a movie for me? Yes, sir, I do. 2016, baby. What? 2016, my man, 2016. Why do you keep saying the current year? Because it's the best year there's ever been. I don't know about that. And it's the inspiration for the movie I'm about to pitch you. Oh, how's that? Well, what was a surprise massive hit movie this year? I guess Deadpool? Exactly, and what was like the biggest mobile game of the year? Pokemon Go? That's right, so I figure we could, you know, Oh. Yeah. You want to hold hands? What? No. Oh, okay. No, that's okay. I'm talking about doing a Pikachu movie starring Ryan Reynolds, you know, basically doing a toned down version of Deadpool. Oh, yeah. That sounds like it would make a lot of money. So how do we approach this? Well, what's the first thing that pops into your head when you think of Pikachu? I don't know. Uh, he shoots lightning. He's... He solves crimes. That's right. But well, that doesn't come to mind at all. Oh, well, it should. There's an averagely reviewed video game called Detective Pikachu on Nintendo 3DS. Oh, when did that come out? When do you think? 2016. 2016. Yeah, I thought so. So what would happen in the movie? We're gonna get to see some Pokeballs get thrown around? Oh, you're darn right we will. Amazing. Once, briefly, at the beginning. Oh. Yeah, so we're gonna start the movie with Mewtwo escaping from a lab and making a car crash. Okay. And then we're gonna meet this guy, Tim, with a dead-end job and a dead mom who finds out his dad's dead. Oh my god, that sounds so dark. Oh, it will be. The first 20 minutes are gonna be very depressing for the most part. Jeez. So anyway, Tim has to go to Rhyme City, which is this place where Pokemon and humans coexist peacefully. Very cool. And when he goes to his dad's mailbox, he meets this reporter, Lucy Stevens. And what's her deal? Well, she's looking into his father's death, and if we could get the actress to be, like, super bubbly and over the top, that'd be great. Oh, I feel like that's really gonna clash with the tone we've been working with. Yeah, for sure. It's gonna feel like she's acting in a different movie. I mean, okay. So at his dad's apartment, he runs into a little Pikachu with a detective hat, an amnesia, and a coffee addiction. Oh, addictions are tight. No, no, they're not. Coffee and chocolate are the only socially acceptable ones. That's fair. Anyway, somehow Tim can hear this Pikachu talk and let me tell you something, he sounds a whole lot like Deadpool. Money. And they find these mysterious vials of purple gas that makes Pokemon go crazy that have these R's on them. Oh, Team Rocket? No, shut up. Okay. And so Pikachu reveals that he was Tim's dad's partner and he thinks he's still alive. Oh, interesting. So Tim and Pikachu are gonna try to solve this case, you know, by visiting all these different Pokemon products. Nice. Sorry, did I say products? I meant characters. No, I liked it the first way. Oh, okay. So anyway, they're gonna meet this Mr. Mime product that mimes everything he does, but he actually makes makes the things he's miming. Oh, very cool. And so they're gonna mime dowsing him in gasoline. Oh, very dark. And then they accidentally mime lighting him on fire. Oh my god. Anyway, so moving on. Wait, did they actually kill the Mr. Mime? I don't know. Well, okay then. So anyway, we're also gonna meet this guy, Howard Clifford, who founded Rhyme City. Oh, and what's his deal? Well, he's in a wheelchair and he's always talking about how Pokemons can evolve, but humans can't. Oh, so he's the bad guy? No. Seems pretty obvious that he is, though. Nuh-uh, he's not. But he probably is, though. And we're also gonna learn more about Mewtwo, like a Apparently, he caused that car crash to save Tim's dad. Oh, okay. And we're gonna learn that with his psychic powers, he can transfer a human's consciousness into a Pokemon. Oh, so Pikachu is actually Tim's dad. What? No. I mean... Oh, and also, we're gonna see Tim's dad a bunch of times, but we're never gonna see his face. So his dad is actually Ryan Reynolds. You sound insane right now. What? I don't think these twists you're setting up are gonna be as twisty as you think they're gonna be. I don't know what you're talking about. So what else happens? Well, we're gonna have this scene with these giant Torteras walking around. It's gonna be like an Inception type thing, it's probably gonna be pretty expensive. Oh yeah, that does sound expensive, and what's the point of that scene? It's so Pikachu can get a little bonk on the head and no other reason. I guess that's worth the money. Yeah, so then Mewtwo shows up to help, but he gets captured by Howard's evil son. Uh-oh. And then we're gonna find out that Howard himself was evil this whole time. No, yeah, I know. And he wants to transfer everybody's minds into their Pokemon. Why? Because that works. And so in his office at the top of a skyscraper, he puts on this little headband thing that lets him control Mewtwo, so Tim is like, you know, uh-oh. Oh man, yeah, it's gonna be impossible to stop him when he's controlling a powerful Pokemon like Mewtwo. Actually, it's gonna be super easy, barely an inconvenience. Oh really? Yeah, see, he flies off as Mewtwo, but he leaves Tim in the room with his vulnerable body still wearing the unsecured headset. Oh, that's pretty irresponsible. Yeah, he does leave Tim with a ditto to fight though. Oh, a ditto, huh? Yeah, it's gonna be this twist. See, you think that Howard's son is evil, but it was actually a ditto taking his place the whole time. Oh, a ditto can take the form of a human. What's that gonna look like? Oh, it's gonna be really cool. It's gonna look kind of like this. Oh my god, that's horrifying. Oh, it is? Oh, yeah, that's the worst thing I've ever seen. I hate that. Oh, my bad. That's just what I look like with my glasses off. Oh, oh boy. Okay, what happens next? Well, Howard needs Pokemon to, like, go crazy before he can do the consciousness transfer, so he needs to use that purple gas on everybody. Okay. And I don't know why, but I had this amazing image in my head of him maybe using parade floats as a way to disperse the gas. Uh, I think you might have that image in your head, because that's exactly what happened in Batman back in the day. Oh, whoops. Whoopsie. Anyway, 
anyway, so then Tim takes the headband thing off of Howard so he doesn't control Mewtwo anymore. Well, good. But then Pikachu falls from the height of a skyscraper, and somehow Tim gets down there just as fast, but in a safe way. Oh, wow, that building must have crazy elevators. Yeah, probably. And then we're gonna learn that Pikachu was Tim's dad the whole time. Right. Didn't see that coming, did you? No, yeah, you spelled it out quite a bit. Very twisty. And then at the end, we're gonna see that it's Ryan Reynolds. Yeah, so. Well, it sounds like it'll probably make a lot of money. Yeah, you think? Yeah, I mean, you took two of the biggest money makers of 2016 and smashed them together. I did, I did. I wonder if there's another money-making strategy we could use to take this whole thing to the next level. So, you have an animated movie for me. Yes, sir, I do. And it kind of takes the things having a secret life premise from Toy Story, but for like a new generation that doesn't play with toys anymore. Oh, so what's gonna have a secret life? What would a kids use more than toys these days? Oh, okay, I think I see where you're going with this. Yeah? Yeah, you want to make an emoji movie? Oh my god, no. Yeah, as soon as I said it, it sounded like an awful idea. Nobody should ever do that. And I pray that they don't. That would be truly terrible. Yeah, no, this movie's called Wreck-It Ralph, and it's about the secret life of video game characters that live in an arcade. Oh, sweet. Kids are always at arcades these days. Yeah, not only are arcades all over the place, but they're always packed. It is a good time to own an arcade. So what happens in the movie? Well, the main character, Ralph, has been the bad guy in this video game called Fix-It Felix Jr. for 30 years. And his life kind of sucks when compared to the good guys, so he decides that he's sick of being a bad guy. Wait, he's been living that crappy life for 30 years? Why only do something about it now? It's the 30th anniversary of the game. Right, but he must have been feeling this way for a long time time. What makes this moment so special? This is when the movie starts. Gotcha. So anyway, to be a good guy, he needs to win a medal, so he decides to sneak into another game to do that. How are the games connected? Well, they're all plugged into the same surge protector, and if one of the machines gets unplugged, the characters in it die. Wait, so they've never once unplugged the game in 30 years? That's what we're going with. What if something that's not a video game gets plugged in? Like, what if the janitor plugs in his vacuum? Can they go in the vacuum? Oh, please don't think about the world building this much. Why not? Well, it's the kind of world building that falls apart if you think about it, so it's best not to do that. Fair enough. Anyway, so we find out through Sonic the Hedgehog that if characters die outside their own game, they're dead for good. So Ralph goes into a safe little game to win a medal? No, he goes into the most dangerous, violent, murdery game in the whole arcade. Oh, he does? Yeah, and then at this point in the script, I actually ran out of video game jokes to make. Must have been hard to finish a script about video games without any video game jokes left. Actually, super easy. Barely an inconvenience. Oh, really? Yeah, I just had Ralph head over to this game called Sugar Rush, so we start making candy puns instead of video game puns. Oh, abruptly switching your pun strategy is tight. Anyway, so Sugar Rush is this kind of racing game, and Ralph meets this character, Vanellope, who's not allowed to race because she's a glitch. Okay. And she steals Ralph's medal to sneak into the race, so if she doesn't win, he's not getting it back. Wow, this character sounds like a massive glitch. Yeah, it was a real glitch move on her part, but she's actually pretty nice. So what else should I know about Sugar Rush? Well, the place is run by this guy, King Candy. Oh, we should make him be like the Mad Hatter in Alice in Wonderland. What do you mean? Like, we just straight up make him look and sound exactly like the Mad Hatter. Why Why would we do that, though? Why wouldn't we do that? But why would we? Listen, I just really like Alice in Wonderland, so this is something that's gonna happen, okay? But I don't understand. This is happening. Are you on board or not? Oh my god, I guess I'm on board. Great. Well, that got scary. So what else happens in the movie? Well, at the end, we're gonna find out that he's actually a bad guy named Turbo in disguise. And he snuck into the game when his game got unplugged. Then he completely recoded it to make Vanellope a glitch instead of the princess that she he actually is. How does a video game character know how to recode an entire game? I don't know, but he also erases everyone's memories so they don't know that she's a princess. How does he know how to do that? Dude, I don't even know. Wow, this guy has such a convenient skill set. Anyway, so Vanellope ends up winning the race, which completely fixes and resets the game. Why would winning a video game do that? Because that's what I wrote. Fair enough. So then Ralph goes back to his original job, but everyone's happy now. So, so what's the message here exactly? I don't know. I guess it's kind of you should just accept your position in life no matter how crappy, and just do your job with a smile and keep your mouth shut. That is an important lesson for kids to learn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you said that Sonic the Hedgehog is gonna be in this movie? Are there any other well-known characters? Yeah, I have a few, but to be honest, I tried to keep it to a minimum. How come? Well, it kind of just felt like a cheap gimmick to get people to come watch the movie. Oh yeah, that's not our style. We'd never do something like that. 
So, you have a movie idea for me. Yes, sir, I kind of do. Kind of? Well, I was pitching a commercial to the people at LEGO, and they were like, this is kind of long, so I was like, maybe it could be a movie. So your movie idea is just a really long commercial for LEGO? Right, we make an extended commercial and call that a movie. It'd be super easy, barely an inconvenience. Don't get me wrong, I love product placements, but usually we try to be a little subtle about it. Well, I figured maybe if the entire movie is one big product placement, then maybe people will forget that we're trying to sell them toys. Oh, that's kind of evil. Well, maybe, but if it works, we're gonna make a ton of money. Oh, uh, making money is tight. Hail Satan. What? Nay, you see our illustrious literal Oh, you're kind of freaking me out, you freaky boy. So what happens in the movie? Well, we're gonna follow Emmett, the main Lego product. Don't you mean character? No. So anyway, there's a prophecy that says that Emmett is the special, kind of like a chosen one. Sounds kind of like the plot of The Matrix. Oh no, this is nothing like The Matrix. It's not? No, it's just about a plain loner guy that meets an edgy, badass looking girl, and she tells him about a prophecy of a chosen one, then he finds out that his world isn't what he thought it was, and his whole perception of reality is shattered, and then there's this wise trainer guy that's super into the chosen one prophecy, and they go inside the main guy's head for training. There's also a ruthless law enforcement type with sunglasses that's after him. There's sentinels that attack everyone, and the main guy is gonna seemingly die, but then come back to life with the ability to see reality in a whole new way, and basically has superpowers now. That sounds a lot like the plot of The Matrix. No, see, Batman is in this. Oh, Batman is in this. Okay, Batman's not in The Matrix. Right. So what else happens in the commercial? Well, Emmett is gonna stumble upon this thing called the Peace of Resistance, and that's gonna give him, like, a magical vision. Oh, very cool. But then later, we're gonna find out that the entire prophecy was made up by this Lego product, Vitruvius. So how did the Peace give him a vision? I don't know. Fair enough. Yeah, the thing is, at the end of the commercial, we're gonna find out that the whole thing was kind of playing out in the imagination of a child. Oh, so things don't actually have to make sense. Exactly, a little screenwriting gift I gave to myself. Very smart. Yeah, so basically the whole movie, the main Lego product's gonna jump from crazy place to crazy place and meet a whole bunch of other Lego products. So is there anything else I should know about the story? Not really, everything's gonna move so fast and have so many joke attempts that the audience won't be able to focus on anything. Oh, it's like ADD the movie. Yeah, it's gonna be like flipping through a Lego catalog while an action movie plays in the background and someone shines a strobe light in your eyes. I love it. And then you get to the end of the catalog and Will Ferrell walks in and you're like, I guess this was nice. So you said this is all kind of happening in a kid's imagination? Yeah, it's gonna be a big twist. Emmett's gonna end up in the real world where it turns out this kid was playing with his dad's Lego products the whole time. Okay. And Emmett's gonna start moving around to get the kid's attention? In the real world? Yeah. So it's not all in the kid's imagination? I don't know. Fair enough. Anyway, the dad's gonna get mad because his kid did a bunch of weird stuff with his Lego products. Oh, doing weird stuff with Lego products is tight. But then he's gonna bond with him because he did a bunch of weird stuff with his Lego products. Oh, did the kid do something to change his mind? No, but there was like a battle in Lego world or something? I'm very confused about how the real world stuff works. Me too, but if you don't think about it at all, it has kind of a nice heartfelt message. What's the message? Uh, that you shouldn't follow instructions? Don't the Lego products we're trying to sell come with instructions? Right, but kids should disregard those, I guess. Okay. But also sometimes it's good to follow the rules. What? And also everyone is special. Kind of a lot of messages going on here. And people should avoid getting brainwashed by mass media and corporations. I'm not sure we're in the best position to be preaching about that. Well, we're gonna preach about that. Well, all right then. So what do you think? Well, I still think it's gonna be tough to trick people into coming to watch a feature-length commercial, you know? I guess. I mean, people always skip commercials on TV and YouTube pre-roll ads. Yeah, I guess we are asking them to pay to come watch a really long one. But I suppose we can give it a shot and see if it works. Great. And oh man, if people fall for this, we're gonna make a ton of commercials. Sitching. So, you have a movie for me? Yes, sir, I do. I've been working very closely with Jerry Seinfeld on this script. Oh, Jerry Seinfeld, interesting. Yeah, it's gonna be called Bee Movie, you know, like a bee movie, but this is about actual bees. Oh, the title is a pun, that's, that's something. Yeah, and I don't want to name drop, but this whole thing started when Jerry was having lunch with Steven Spielberg. Oh, Spielberg. And Steven said he absolutely loved the idea, so we just ran with it. If he loved it so much, why isn't he producing it? I... I, I don't know. Do you think he might have said that as a joke? Oh my god. But you said Jerry Seinfeld's attached? Yeah, he is. Okay, well then I could sell this thing, no problem. Great. Anyway, so what's the movie about? Right, so the main character is named Barry B. Benson. Okay. You see how his middle name is B? Right. Please clap. Oh, uh... Thank you. So we meet Barry and he's starting his day, you know, he sharpens his stinger. 
Listen, that's very clever, but I can't clap every time you make a bee joke. Oh, that's fair, because you'd be clapping this whole time. I should probably point out, though, that male bees don't have stingers. I'm pretty sure bees have stingers, sir. Not male bees, no. Well, anyway, so then Barry talks to his mom and dad about how- Wait, his mom and dad? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But hives have queens, and they give birth to all the bees, so he wouldn't have a mom and dad. Well, how was I supposed to know that? Did you write an entire movie about bees without doing any research on bees? First of all, yes. Okay. Second of all, in this movie, if I have the chance to make a bee joke, then facts will absolutely come second, okay? Oh, disregarding facts for the sake of puns is tight. Puns are all that matter in this world, sir. Oh, I think you might have just revealed some of the darkness lurking deep within your soul. Oh, whoops. Whoopsie. Anyway, so Barry has to go to his graduation ceremony, so he and his friend Adam hop in their little bee car and they drive off. They have cars, but they can fly. Listen, Jerry Seinfeld likes cars. I don't know what to tell you. Well, okay then. And then Barry finds out that when he picks a job, he's stuck with it for life. How did he not already know that. Unclear. Huh. So he goes out on a pollen mission in Central Park and almost gets killed by a couple playing tennis. Okay. And then it starts to rain and he lands in the apartment of the tennis players. He lands in the apartment of the same people he encountered in Central Park? That's right. What are the odds of that? I don't know. Math is hard. That's true. It is. So anyway, this guy Ken is about to kill Barry, but then his wife Vanessa saves him. Wow, that's very nice of her. Yeah, so then Barry's gonna, you know, instantly fall in love with her. What? Yeah, he gets all nervous and flustered. He thinks she's just beautiful. You're saying we're gonna have a romantic storyline between a human woman and a bee? That's right, sir, we are. But how would that even work? Well, I'm glad you asked that question, because I actually have some very detailed drawings I'd like to show you. Oh, no, 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 thank you. Oh, okay, I'll just email them over to you then. Please don't. Oh, should I burn them? Absolutely, yeah, please burn those as soon as you can. I'll get right on that after this meeting, sir. I have a flamethrower in my car. You what? Anyway, so the bees have this one huge rule where they're not allowed to talk to humans, right? Okay. But Barry's in love with this woman, so he goes ahead and talks to her. Oh, wow, so what's gonna happen to Barry for having broken the rules? Absolutely nothing. Oh, and then Barry discovers that humans have been stealing honey this whole time. Right, they didn't know that? Nope, they didn't, so then Barry is gonna sue the human race on behalf of the bees. Oh, he is. Yeah, so then the movie's gonna take a sharp turn and become a courtroom legal battle. And that's gonna be enjoyable for kids to watch? Oh yeah, kids love legal proceedings. I guess a couple of minutes in a courtroom could be funny. This is gonna take up a third of the movie. Oh, it is. Yeah, and then Vanessa and Barry are gonna joke about a suicide pact. Very kid appropriate. And then at a certain point, Barry's friend Adam is gonna sting the human lawyer guy. Male bees don't have stingers though. And it's gonna be a dramatic moment because the whole movie we've been saying that when a bee stings a human, the bee dies. So he dies? Nope. Oh, you're not even following your own rules. Anyway, so eventually the bees win the court case and they get all the honey back and they don't have to work anymore. Wow. And then because of that, all the plants in the world die. Uh oh. So then Barry and Vanessa have to take a plane to go steal a flower float, but then on the plane ride home, the pilots get knocked out and they have to land the plane themselves, so they do it with the help of millions of bees. Sure, all that might as well happen. Yeah, we had no idea what to do for the climax, so we just threw some crazy stuff in there. That's probably fine. Yeah, we figured who really cares at this point. Let's just throw some action on the screen. But what are they gonna do about all the dead plants? It's gonna be hard to reverse that damage. Actually, it's gonna be super easy. Barely an inconvenience. Oh, really? Yeah, they just sprinkle some pollen on the plants and they instantly come back to life. That's not how that works at all. It might be. It's not. Okay, well, is that really gonna change your opinion of this movie? No, it's fine. At this point, we're just straight up making anything to be honest. Oh, you are? Yeah, I mean, we just greenlit a movie about a panda that does kung fu. Okay, yeah, the B movie's gonna look like a masterpiece compared to something like that. So, you have a movie for me? Yes, sir, I do. So I was thinking... Nice. Yeah, so seven out of the 11 Pixar movies from the past decade have been sequels or prequels or spin-offs. Eight if you include Planes. I do not. Fair enough. So I figure on this one we could try something original like we used to. I don't know, sounds kind of unsafe and risky. Well, if it does well, we can make a sequel or a prequel or a spin-off. Uh, that's a good point. So we putting like a Pixar short before this thing? No, I thought we could have a Simpsons short. Oh, show off some of Disney's new purchases. Purchases, I like it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what's the short gonna be about? Maggie Simpson getting romantic. Ugh. But like in a cute way. Oh, okay, and what about the actual movie? Well, it takes place in a fantasy world where magic exists, but nobody uses it anymore because they develop technology, which is easier to use. Wow, 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 wow. Yeah, so we're gonna have like unicorns acting like raccoons. The main characters have a dragon that acts like a dog. That's not an animated movie without a thing that's not a dog acting like a dog. Exactly. So who are the main characters in this thing? These two elf brothers, Ian 
and barley. What are elves like in this world? They're basically humans, but blue with pointy ears. Okay, gotcha. So Ian is 16 and very unsure of himself, right? Right. And Barley is his older, more confident brother that's obsessed with this D&D style game called Quests of Yore. Okay. And so their dad died a long time ago when Ian was just a baby. Oh, I love it. Parents have no business being alive in animated movies. Well, they do still have a mom. Oh. And she actually has a boyfriend who's a centaur. He's a centaur and she's like a human-sized elf. That's right. I, uh, I have some questions. Oh, please don't ask them. Oh, okay, yeah, no, I'll keep those to myself. Anyway, so this centaur is kind of a goofball and he drives since it's easier than running. Running is magic? No, it's just inconvenient, so he has to squeeze into this little human-sized car. If the magical beings are the ones that develop technology, why don't they have cars of different sizes for different creatures? I don't know. Oh, fair enough. So anyway, the kid's dead father leaves them a staff that lets them bring him back for 24 hours. Okay. But they mess up the spell and only bring back his lower half. So like... His crotch? Well, like legs. But like a crotch, though. We're gonna be looking at a man's crotch quite a bit. Okay, yeah, sometimes we're gonna be looking at a crotch, and I know it sounds weird, but it's actually quite touching. Oh, touching crotches are tight. Oh my god. Oh my god, I need to start filtering some of the things I say are tight. You sure do, sir. So anyway, sometimes they're gonna build a fake torso for their dad to pretend that everything's normal. Oh, fake chests are tight. What's that gonna be like? Have you seen Weekend at Bernie's? Sure, yeah. That. Well, okay then. So if they want a shot at completing the spell and speaking with their dad, they need to track down this super rare phoenix stone. Oh, movies about tracking down valuable stones are very hot right now. Yeah, so they take off to go find this thing, because after 24 hours, that's it, he's gone. They don't bring the mom along? They don't, no. Very insensitive. Yeah, I guess, but she's gonna try to follow them the whole time, so we'll check in with her. Oh, okay. So they take off on a road trip in Barley's van, and they meet this manticore lady. And what's her deal? Well, she used to go on adventures and send people on quests, and now she runs a restaurant. Oh. But Ian and Barley make her go crazy and, like, reignite her taste for adventure. How do they do that? By talking to her for about 30 seconds. Oh, that didn't take much. Yeah, I guess she was right on the edge. Wow. So they keep going on this road trip and you know what they encounter? Well, if this is a road trip movie, I'm gonna assume they encounter bikers of some kind. They encounter bikers of some kind. Do they do that thing where they accidentally tip over all their motorcycles? You know it. Never gets old. Never gets old. Right? Oh god, I hope so. So what's up with these bikers? Well, they're these little pixies and since nobody uses magic anymore, they travel on these big motorcycles instead of flying. What? Why wouldn't they fly? Well, at the beginning of the movie, we show that planes exist, so nobody flies anymore. Right, but you can't fly a plane through rush hour traffic. Oh, yeah, no, that's a good point. And if they're tiny, how would planes help them, like, reach shelves and stuff? Listen, sir, I'm gonna need you to get all the way off my back about the magic logic, okay? Oh, yeah, okay, let me get off of that thing. Oh, thank you so much. So what else happens? Well, this is a quest, so they basically travel from obstacle to obstacle and try to get past them. Oh, man, is that gonna be hard for two teenagers to do? Actually, it's gonna be super easy. Barely an inconvenience. Oh, really? Yeah, see, a whole lot of the problems they encounter can actually be solved by magic spells that Ian learns. Oh, Barley can't do magic? Nope, but he knows all about it. How come Ian is the only magical one? I don't know. Fair enough. So eventually they get the Phoenix Stone, but there's a curse that sends this big dragon stone thing after them. Oh, no. Yeah, and there are only a couple minutes left before the dad's visitation spell wears off. Oh, no. But see, Ian had this checklist of things he wanted to do with his dad, and he realizes that Barley actually checked all those boxes is off by being his brother. Okay. So Ian fights off the dragon and lets Barley say goodbye to their dad, which he was too scared to do in the hospital as a kid. Okay, so this is how we get the tears. This is how we get the tears. I was told that was a requirement. Oh, yeah, Pixar runs on tears. Right. We run on tears. Oh, my God. So what kind of voice talent were you thinking on this thing? Well, I thought we could do some more cross-pollination of things that Disney owns and grab some talent from the MCU. That's smart. So who should we get to voice Barley? Well, overly confident character who thinks thinks their plans are always the best. Sounds like a certain somebody from Guardians of the Galaxy. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so you're thinking... I am, uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh, Glenn Close. No, Chris Pratt. Oh, yeah, that is a much better choice. What about Ian? Well, he's an awkward, scrawny teenager. That's Tom Holland to a T. Oh, yeah, that's a good point. We better snatch him up fast before another animated movie takes him for that kind of role. Oh, yeah, we're gonna want to be first on that for sure. <laughs> 